Hello, Hello, Dr. Mira. Today we will talk about DIFA, Mosca, and uh, our speaker, Mike Chang, will be us. He's the founder and CEO of DIFA. Uh, we would like to thank them to provide us this space, event, and content. And uh, before we start, we get on into this one company. Thank you, Mike. You found it in 2015 and you have different programs for the legal, national services. You found a billion other courses like You can check out the website uh, to learn more about our programs and our events. You're always welcome to your events. I'm excited. I want to announce my town with a round of applause. Thank you. Hey everybody, um, my name is Mike, like I said. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, this is the uh, SRI, Center Research Institute, and uh, the bus offices are, you know, they're really like 50 yards, maybe in that direction. Um, today, um, first of all, I want to thank Bank Alliance and the Meetup Group for bringing you all here today. Um, so, um, as you might have noticed when you signed in, um, Everyone um, wants to has been given a free device token, and we'll, we'll use that in the second half of uh, this workshop. And hopefully, uh, you'll get a chance to use the hands on playing with the device knowledge graph. Uh, so, hang on to that. Um, the main thing that we want to cover today is um, we want to teach you guys about this field of automated knowledge bases. Um, we're going to have um, Julia from our research team uh, give an overview for you know how the technology works and how it's applied, um, how we build the world's largest knowledge graph as a file. And um, I'm going to then talk a little bit about how uh, it's used in various parts of the data science lifecycle. And then I'm going to read a draft tutorial where I actually get hands on the knowledge graph to go through some uh, examples of it. Um, so with that, I'm going to go to Julian to talk about the technology. Um, all right, so my name is Julia. I'm going to work in my own company. And I'm going to walk you through the different steps in the stack to build a knowledge graph. Um, uh, so you know what you're doing with the bank. And um, basically, the, the aim of the research team so far is to build a map of uh, human knowledge, the most popular thing happening in the Knowledge and the graph like structure can be found. So, how do we do that? So, we start off with crawling, um, and a lot of people confuse crawling with scraping. They're actually two different steps that work hand in hand. And um, we start off with a seeds page, and we render that page, and we try to find links um, that link us to further pages that also include relevant information that we would be interested in having in our different knowledge graph. Um, so you would have to imagine this is like a brand first search through the network. Um, and we we crawl about 200 million pages a day, plus minus. Um, and then when we have a given page, we want to we wanna know what we're dealing with before we jump into any expression. Right? So with a given page, you want to categorize what type of page is it and what language is it in. And so we do that by using the same kind of cues we as humans will use. We see an article page, right? It doesn't say, like, hey, I'm an article. You as a human know because it has a big title and because it has a long text and some media that you're dealing with an article page. Um, so we segment the pages and we use a combination of language models to figure out what category of page we're dealing with. So once we know what we're dealing with, we can call the relevant extractor for that given type of page, right? So imagine uh, we find a page, we find out it's a part of and it's an English, right? We now want to go into that step where we find the relevant information about that and read about that product that we want to see in the knowledge graph. So again, just like the human, we try and encode um, how the different cues we as humans would use, right? Nowhere does it say that this is the name of the product we're dealing with, um, but we as a human, we're like, okay, this is bold, this is emphasized, this must be the name of the product, right? Straightforward. Same goes with the blob of text. No one doesn't say that this blob of text is actually talking about the jumble of the 
huge. But as humans, we see that there is a blob of text that is in proximity with some kind of geometrical alignment to that particular title. So we assume that this is product information, not some just general information about Nike. Um, so at the end of this step, we, we, um, we have four types of data, right? So we end up with structured data. And it's structured, great. We take it as it is, we might want to normalize it, but it, it has been structured for us because we don't have to extract it from, we don't have to extract it from another, uh, from, from the data itself. Then we have unstructured data and that's usually text. Um, and the text usually contains complementary information. That's information we would lose if we can try and go into the text and try and extract the identity. Um, we also use image data, so we, we want to include the image in the knowledge graph, but we can also use computer vision to find out further details of the entity we're extracting from, for example, that this particular item is green. And then lastly, we infer a bunch of stuff. So for the product example, we, um, we infer that this is a piece of content, right? So if somebody uses the knowledge graph and they want to filter by product type, um, they can say like, hey, just show me clothing. Um, so to come back to the unstructured data, um, we have an NLP team that works on extracting from text. And this really doesn't do justice to the type of stuff they do, but just to give you a quick overview. Um, is, so you have, a, you have text from a product description or from a news article, right? And you wanna get the most out of the text. So you do something called named entity recognition, which is basically trying to find the named entity in the text, right? So to give you an example, the Miami Dolphins are actually a football team and not a Miami-based animal, right? So this is something we need to find out. And then we want to find out the relations between the entities we find in the text. So for example, well, Sal is working for the Miami Dolphins. This is a relation that we can encode in the triple, right? So this is the subject predicate object. Um, the next uh, one of the steps would be called reference, right? So if you use, if you have pronouns and the pronoun has a relation, we want to be able to uh, map that relation to the pronoun is referring to, right? So in that case, uh, Robert Sal was working for UPS. We know that he referred to Robert Sal. And then entity linking deals with mapping the computer level and entity in the knowledge graph, right? So, um, once we have a number of uh, uh, sources and a number of entities, we want to figure out which ones are actually talking about the same thing. So here we have Mike, and we found information about Mike on five different sheets, right? We don't want five different Mike tongue entities in the knowledge graph. We want one entity about Mike, and we want it to contain all the information from the five different, um, from the five different pages. And that is a step called record linking. Now, what do we do when there's contradicted information, right? So one page might say he's based in San Francisco. The other page might say he's based in Menlo Park. That is a step called data fusion, where um, we take contradicting information, we make a decision, which one is correct? Do we discard the other fact, or do we keep it as a non-current fact? So maybe he used to live in a different location, we want to keep um, and that's how we end up with the entities we're going to be working with today. So I'm going to hand back to Mike. Thank you, everyone. Great introduction to our technology. Um, so I want to talk now about uh, how this, so you can see we use machine learning uh, basically everywhere in our stack. It's a fully autonomous system that's crawling the web classifying every page, extracting the information from those pages in all the different languages on the web to build this world's largest knowledge graph. I'll talk about how this applies to the data science lifecycle, how uh, the top companies are already using these kind of automated techniques to solve a lot of very hard data problems, and how uh, the data science lifecycle is going to be able to do uh, very hard you know, things like that. Um, this is something how many people in this room are currently going back to data scientists? Okay. How many people are my students like going into data science? Okay. Um, how many people want to do this kind of work? Okay. Um, 
are um, business people, or business analysts that want to like understand the technology that you know, sort of a real business problem. Right. Um, okay. How many people did raise their hand? Okay. What do you do? Okay, so more about the machine learning side. Okay, cool. So, um, what's in this slide should be should be surprising to anybody, right? This is like a typical data science life cycle, right? It's like if you work as a data scientist within a company, right? You spend your time understanding what is the business problem, right? Maybe some like giving you a task to do, maybe your 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 Teams told us to try to find the problems to solve, right? Like find the business and taking uh, the organization. Um, we spend some time getting the data, right? To analyze. Uh, you're either getting this data from the business company or outside the company. Uh, you're cleaning the data, uh, exploring the data, like case based coordination is really high up, uh, feature engineering, uh, predictive modeling, actually building the model and visualizing the data and sharing it, right? With the rest of the organization, right? And then this is a cycle because after you have a good site, then you might want to drill down even further. That might cover new things, so it's still still good too, right? Or um, you might be repeating some kind of analysis that needs to happen on a, a quarterly basis, right? So, right? so it's really like a loop. So the point I want to make here is that um, you know uh, that we have all these tools, right? Python, the feature engineering, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Um, Power BI, Tableau, Web Search, and SQL, right? Um, if you look at how data scientists actually spend their time, it's not evenly distributed like that pie chart, right? So this is a study done by Cloudflower uh, by uh, asking over 80, 80 data scientists what they do. And if you can't read that, it says, um, you know, this large 60% of the time is um, cleaning and organizing the data, that 90% of the time is collecting the data. Um, 90% 90, 90 of the time is mining the data for patterns. Um, 4% of the time is refining those algorithms, and 5% other, right? Um, now you might think, um, well, that's the way it's not just like you, like just other time cleaning the data, right? Um, oh, no, that's not true. This is what they ask. It's like, um, what is the least enjoyable part of data science? And it's cleaning and organizing data and collecting those data sets. Right. Um, so, you know, we have all of these uh, kind of shiny toys, right, that we spend a lot of attention about. And, you know, we're TensorFlow, PyTorch, right, there's sites like Kaggle and stuff, focus on basically the part of the life cycle that we spend none of our time on, right, on less than, um, less than 5%, you know, our time is actually, less than 10% of our time is actually doing that. Um, so, uh, to work on slides. So, this one is actually helping solve this part of the life cycle the actual gathering of the data and the cleaning of the data, which you actually spend most of your time doing. Um, and there's very few tools that can help you actually do that. This is actually one area where we think uh, machine learning uh, can actually have a great effect with being a developer by the large company, right? If you are a team that uh, your lead team that's doing data science, but you know that the greatest cost of doing data science is actually the people, right? Um, hiring the people to do it. So that part of where the time spent is actually where the money goes too, right? And where the data science is right? Um, so let's go to um, just a quick review of these terms because it really shows you our process of how we write the web and end up at an entity in our knowledge graph. So, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows what an entity means, right? So, an entity is basically a real thing out there in the world, right? It's an actual person, organization, a place, right? You see people over here, you see products right here, this is just the place. Um, you don't want to forget that every piece of data is actually representing something physical, something out there in the world, right? And the properties are the facts, the attributes, the terms, the fields of that thing, right? So a person might have an age, a product might have a weight, right? Uh, a place might have a latitude and longitude. These are properties, aka facts, 
we kind of use the word rooms or fields when we're talking about searching those properties. Um, and a very special kind of property is uh, a relation, which is a link to another entity, right? So you can see in this table here, the existing characters, um, you have the type of entity, right? It would be a missing character or like a fictional character. That would be the entity type. Um, there's different facts about those entities. Um, one of these properties is a city, right? So you might imagine the city itself could be modeled as a separate in a the table, right? And that would be uh, probably better if, you know, for example, like Anaheim could be further to multiple cities, right? In the world are probably called Anaheim, right? So just storing it as this string Anaheim wouldn't allow for that fact, right? Like modeling as a separate entity is a ridiculous. Sort of like some basic concepts. We usually call the entity types and the relationships between those types and the properties the ontology. And when we're searching um, graph or database, um, we have you know various software search we can use for asking the world to commit to something that's very specific. Yeah, only logic operators and or uh, uh, store uh, comparison. So when something uh, is numerical like this, we can tell one would be one would be greater than the other. Um, with the sorting of the entities, uh, faceting the entities is basically breaking these entities into buckets, right? So it's kind of like a group by operator, SQL, so that would be better for with that. Um, there's geographical uh, distances, so especially for places like the, the distance of the earth, so that's the average time distance. And um, there's, uh, in addition to the physical distance to the world, there's um, semantic distance, right? And similarity, right? So, how uh, similar is this person to another person or this product to another product, right? And that kind of semantic similarity is often very task dependent, right? So, the distance between two people would vary depending on whether I'm trying to sell to them or hire them, right? Or date them, right? So, very different kinds of distance. Um, so it's very um, customer specific or task specific. Um, so how do we apply these sort of geometric techniques to the design class level? Right? So in data gathering, uh, generally if you're working as a data scientist, there's, there's two sources of data, you know, right? Either it's internal inside your organization, and uh, you know, uh, it's either on paper or it's stored in some database somewhere. And so we use tools like SQL to get better for those internal databases. Or you acquire the data, that data external, right? You survey people, you go talk to people, you do a bunch of Googling, you search the web, try to get a bunch of data set, or you might use like a data labeling service. Um, and you know, that, like, each of those steps involves a bunch of manual uh, effort, right? So um, with Zipbot, um, we can help accelerate uh, this stage by doing automated interaction, like Cody was talking about before. And by including this external source that had a lot of knowledge in it already. So uh, it's a pop framework, which ETUL is kind of like SQL, but it's for the outside world. And the difference between the data knowledge graph and the company's internal database is the data knowledge graph is kept up to date by an autonomous AI system that constantly scouring and reading around the thing. So that data database actually matches those entities out there in the real world. That's uh, what the data and this to represent. Um, data cleaning, uh, just real quick, some common problems. So why do we spend 60% of our time cleaning data, right? Data is a physical, why would it be dirty? Um, there's incomplete data, right? So I would argue incompleteness is just a property of data. Uh, it's not possible to have fully incomplete data. So there's obviously incomplete data like no entries, but then um, you might not just have enough data to solve the business problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, if the business problem you're trying to solve is called a physical and realistic simulation of the universe, then your data needs to include the organization of all the atoms in the data across the company for that task, right? So it's very task specific. Um, so um, what is incomplete is not matching the business requirements of what you actually need in your analysis. Um, the data could be incorrect, so it could be the wrong value on there or encoding the wrong way. Uh, data entry or some other data enter into the database in the first place. Uh, I don't know, like I can ask why I used to work as a data entry person. So if you got tired of the wrong keystroke, 
So that's a source of error, right? How many data does the data usually capture in a particular point in time where the world changes? So the data was after the one point, but then came out after it. Um, you have to look at records. If you want to see an example, if you look at records, just look at your contacts book and your book. Um, it's probably even like maybe like mine, like a merger. Uh, being auto imported from Gmail, stuff from like an old cell phone that was added a long time ago at different points in time. So it's very easy for duplicates to be introduced and sort of uninterpretable data. So you might not have been the person that uh, produced the data, it might have been inherited from another team in an organization, or it might be in a totally different way of using it. So uh, you actually can't access it, just like gibberish, right? Uh, can anyone diagnose any classes of, of data problems? Does anyone have ever? Category data problems that we've seen that's not in that that set. No one's aware of this. So, um, so I want you to take away is that machine learning can actually help fix all of these problems. Uh, it can find the missing information that's not in your database. It can fix incorrect information, normalize the information so it's in a standardized format, keep it always up to date so your data doesn't become stale. Automatically link the record with that record the same thing that it duplicates and actually can interpret the unstructured data and the text and data. Um, so these are actually problems that are very well suited for machine learning. And um, uh, uh, the leading companies are already starting to adopt uh, to fix a lot of the problems automatically with data. Uh, it's one of the largest problems in sort of the modern enterprise because it's from information databases. That are stale and not totally done, right? And if you're a data scientist, basically, you have garbage going in, that garbage going out, and your analysis can't be trusted, and that you start to know it, right? Your, your data system no longer reflects the reality. So, um, to find accounts is basically a machine learning algorithm that can link your internal entities, say your data, to our little knowledge graph to keep the data from being interrupted. And we're actually going to do a tutorial on that, uh, we'll be able to run that in a second. Um, Last slide before we dive into the tutorial, uh, exploring the data, right? So we have um, tools that allow you to browse our knowledge graph. There's a dashboard that you guys all created an account for uh, when you sign it. Um, there's ways you can inspect the provenance of the information. So the data um, is inside the knowledge graph. You, you, know, you can um, know the industry of where it came from because there's ways you can inspect the original origin of that data to see the primary source, the actual original pages on the web. That, that information came from. It's all full of information. You could verify finally yourself if you wanted to, to, to see that. Um, we have simple ways that you can quickly visualize uh, results of queries. Uh, you can save and share your queries for other people, and you can export the data out of the knowledge graph to, to like CSV and JSON to use them. But then there's other you know, more high power tools like Tableau and Power BI and stuff that are designed especially for visualization. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're gonna do the tutorial. Um, hopefully, you can. Sorry about that. So for this first tutorial, um, all we're going to do is um, break into a data warehouse and uh, use your um, credentials that you created when you log in. Um, to sign into the app.jpod.com or dashboard. And what we have, uh, the bottom people there, John, is uh, to help you with stuff to uh, model around and help anyone that doesn't um, have trouble logging in. Um, so, in this first tutorial, what we're going to do is we're going to reproduce a, uh, a data science report that we did last year called uh, the Machine Learning Report. So, what we did was we did the analysis globally of all machine learning talent. And this was really like uh, the largest study at the time because um, uh, the people have done studies with small sample sizes, right? Like just uh, asking machine learning uh, experts, right? And polling. But this is really using web data. So this is uh, the only study that has, I believe, um, hundreds of millions or um, hundreds of thousands or, or millions of uh, machine learning. Practitioners around the world, you know, times or a day or so. Um, so, obviously, a different methodology, but um, way more uh, data points. And we're going to reproduce that report in the next uh, 15 minutes. 
but we're going to do it for um, the population of data scientists. Uh, so if you want to follow along in the tutorial, just go to uh, that URL, trainingurl.com slash YouTube tutorial. Uh, your browser, let's get Google out. Uh, if you want to read also um, that report, there's a link to it um, right here in the Google Sheet. So um, this was uh, this this study was featured on in Forbes, and it was also uh, incited by um, other studies. Um, so the first step is um, we're actually going to do this uh, tutorial through um, our leading edge Google Sheets integration. So um, you guys will be able to experience really like the leading edge. This, this hasn't yet been published to Google Sheets integration to the App Store. So the installation process requires uh, copy and paste in some code. But um, uh, let's see, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, once it's actually uh, in the Google App Store, uh, installing the plugin will be quite simple. But, uh, let's do to get started. First, go to your um, log into your uh, Diffbot dashboard, and then go to this URL. And there, you'll be able to see your um, API token. So you'll see it here at the top of your token. And, um, and then. Um, after that, your token, um, what you want to do is basically create a new Google Sheet um, using Google Sheets. And then you want to go to um, Tools, Script Editor, and then copy and paste this code. And then just change the first line to use your default API token. Um, so I'll just walk around and, uh, and maybe help everyone that get it stuck with just like the installation part. I'm sorry, you want So if, um, well, that's a, good, that's a good question. We'll do that in step one. Uh, basically, if you say you're a data scientist and you are on the web, you, you return to that here. Um, oh, sorry, I'll go back. If you guys are having trouble trying to control Wi-Fi, there is a public Wi-Fi, and there's also a private Wi-Fi that's not for the server. Our house is in Charles Hill. Um, the link to this document is tinyurl.com slash kg tutorial. I'll just put it here. If you um, aren't able to log in, but you know what your email address is, you can just type your email address and put your password. Thank you. 
Okay, so the first thing, um, yeah, my, uh, all right, so um, after you install the script, so basically open a Google Sheet, go to Tools, Script Editor, um, copy and paste uh, that script, and you just put your token up here where it says your token, um, and then you return back to the sheet. Your Google Sheet is now um, draft enabled. You're able to query the knowledge graph from this Google Sheet, and you're also able to enrich data that you already have in your sheet. So the first question uh, that we want to ask, you know, the, I guess the most basic question is how many people in the world are data scientists, right? Um, we know people that have machine learning skills, there's quite a lot, 720,000. Um, we want to basically ask, how many people in the world are uh, data scientists? And to ask that, um, I'll give you the, the first query for free. Um, basically, uh, just type in, pick a cell and type equals DQL, and you'll see uh, an autocomplete uh, with uh, some kind of function assistance. DQL queries knowledge graph using the default query language. And then here, um, you put in a DQL query. So a DQL query is, Kind of similar to SQL, it's basically a precise way of asking a question to the knowledge graph. Um, the question we want to ask here is how many people are data scientists? So um, let me type the query for that and then I'll explain it. Um, basically, to, to get a Google Sheet, you just go to docs.google.com slash spreadsheets. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the query here is type person. So you first tell me well, what entity type you care about. Um, you'll see in the tutorial, there's some documentation um, right here for DQL and if you go to this documentation, you can see, uh, again, what we call the ontology. And this lists all the types that are available in the knowledge graph. So you, you see people, 
uh, we try to include all the most popular kinds of knowledge, right? And we're continually expanding kinds of knowledge, but there's people, there's places, there's organizations. Some of those organizations are educational institutions or local businesses. Um, there's events, there are articles, there are images, there are products, um, there are videos, discussions, and all of these entities are interlinked together in the knowledge graph. Um, but we are trying to include the types that are applicable to most tasks that, right, that many different kind of applications need. Um, so if you look at this query that I wrote and get back to my sheet, I'm looking for all of the entities in the knowledge graph that are of type person. And I'm looking for the people where the employment title, so people have employments, that's an attribute of a person, and where the job title is data scientist, and then I wanna count them. So if you're familiar with SQL, uh, it should be very uh, natural to you. And you can see the count here in my sheet, uh, 1, uh, 118,244. So that's the answer to that question. Um, now, um, so how, uh, let's see, would you identify other related job titles that people use for data scientists, right? Like it's, maybe they're, their job title isn't exactly data scientist, it's like senior data scientist, right? Or data analyst or, or something like that. Uh, but the question is, I don't even know what all the different ways are, right? That people might describe that, that same job. So this is an area where um, DQO and the knowledge graph can help you do that as well. So um, one feature I can introduce to you is faceting. So faceting is a way that you can find um, the other properties uh, inside an entity. So I could say, I want, um, let's say I want to copy that query, but instead I want to uh, facet, they want to copy that query, and then I want to facet on um, employments dot um, title. So what this is doing is it's of those um, 118,244 people, uh, what are the other job titles that they have that describe them, right? So of course, data scientists are called data scientists, but they also might, there's a bunch of data scientists that are research assistants, senior data scientists, interns, uh, software engineers, data analysts, um, and even software developers, right? So that's a quick way that I can sort of expand that, that job title. Uh, and you can see the exact counts, right? Of how many people um, where that job title co-occurs. Oh, it's probably just a little further down. Okay, so um, so we've we've basically restricted you know the whole set of people entities to just the data scientists. Um, another uh, thing we did in our machine learning survey is just tell you some basic stats about data scientists, right? So um, let's compute um, the top skills that data scientists have. Um, any any guesses as to like what are the what's like the top programming language that a data scientist use? Python. Okay. Well, well we're going to see in a second. Um, what's the gender diversity of this field? Right. Um, we want to improve diversity, but to, to do that, we need to actually study it. And what's the location distribution, right, of this of, of people that are data scientists, right? So, um, so I showed you a second ago the faceting. Um, I could just copy and paste that again and facet it on, uh, what was the first thing I wanted to know? The skills, right? So let's see if we were right. Some people said uh, Python. I think I heard pretty loudly. Let's see. So I wanna facet it and you can facet it on, on any property in the knowledge graph. So um, to see the list of all the properties, just look at the documentation. There's the ontology listed there. Um, but I wanna facet it on the skills first. So let's do that. 
Okay, so we can see indeed uh, that person was right. Python is the most popular of these of the skills right here that are programming languages. Um, uh, surprisingly, R is the second, and then SQL, right? And then further down, you have Java and MATLAB and C++, right? Um, now let's answer the diversity question. Any guesses for what the ratio is? So I need to so I'm just using the properties that are in the documentation. So you can see here, uh, interesting. So maybe I can chart that to make it. So there's um, the data scientist field is about 75.7% 75, 75 male, 24.3% female, and there's one transgender female. Okay, um, let's go back to the tutorial. All right, so let's let's move on to more sophisticated things. Um, so you can imagine it, it might have been really difficult to produce this kind of research, right, with manual research or surveying or, or looking for. You wouldn't get at least these large sample sets or these data points. Um, one of the slides in our data, our machine learning report, is the per capita distribution of data scientists, right? So we're not looking for the absolute count of data scientists in each country, but, but we're looking for uh, what percentage of that country population is data scientists, right? So how can we do that uh, in a simple query, right? And our hint is we can use the connected entities property of the knowledge graph. The fact that, you know, uh, like I was showing you in the Mickey Mouse example, the location itself is also an entity. It also has properties, right? Like a population, for example, right? So you can see in our knowledge graph um, DQL documentation, if you look for places, you know, there's administrative areas, there's landmarks. Um, so one of the properties of an administrative area or place is its population, right? So um, I'm gonna do that. Let's see, maybe I need a new sheet, not run out of space here. Um, so maybe I wanna start out with my query again. And this time I wanna fast it by the uh, location, uh, let's say the name. So, uh, sorry, I, maybe I wanna get the uh, country. Okay. Um, use this mic as well. Um, so you can see here, what I'm doing is I'm faceting the whole set of data scientists by country, right? So obviously there's a lot of data scientists in the US, but we're more interested in what's like the per capita distribution, right? So what I can do is take advantage of the fact that every entity in the knowledge graph has an identifier, a unique identifier, and I can use that identifier to look up that entity and get, and get those properties, right? So I can say, I can get the default identifier for that country by just using an ID. So these are the default identifiers for, the, for that country. And I can then build a query. So let's say DQL, um, where I get the population. So I wanna get um, type uh, place where the ID of that place is, um, so I'm gonna concatenate that with the ID and that'll give me um, the ID right there. And then uh, I wanna, which fields do I wanna show in this table? So I wanna give maybe the name of the place and the population. 
right? So that DQL query will help me decode this identifier, right? So that, you know, that, that identifier is United States and that's the population of the United States, right? So if I wanna do that for all of these, right? I can just reproduce that, copy and paste. So here I get um, the populations of uh, all of these identifiers. And there, there's some interesting patterns here, right? So it's, this is not in the same order that this is in, right? So um, let's say I wanted to get the per capita. I could basically take this, which is the number of data scientists divided by that. And that would give me the per capita percentage, right? So, If I wanted to visualize that, I can see right here that, you know, it, surprisingly, the Netherlands has the largest per capita distribution of data scientists, right? Even though the United States is the top of the list in terms of absolute number, the Netherlands actually has the greatest percentage per capita. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause for a minute and then I'm gonna pose the bonus question. So um, we wanna find, um, let's say more data scientists to come to MagnaMind's uh, meetup groups. So we wanna find the list of the top employers of data scientists within a 50 mile radius of this location, Menlo Park. So that's a query that you can run in the knowledge graph. And you can not only get the list of the people, but you can get a list of those companies. So um, I'll, I'll pause for a minute to walk around, help people that might maybe uh, struggling to follow, follow along. And then um, you can work on that. And then I'll, I'll share how to do that. All right, um, did you guys figure out that query? So I'm gonna get, try to give it a try. Um, so obviously we want uh, 
we want um, we're, we're looking for people that are data scientists that are within a 50 mile radius right of Menlo Park. So 50 mile radius, we know we want to use the geographical distance um, that I was talking about before of places. So um, that's where um, if you looked at the detailed documentation, like the near operator can help with that. So I'm looking again for um, people uh, that uh, are data scientists. So employment title, data scientist, and um, where they're based 50 miles from Menlo Park. So where their location um, is uh, near uh, within 50 miles. Um, and I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to describe Menlo Park. So you see there, it's actually using our NLP to understand which entity Menlo Park is re being referred to there. Um, and then I want to facet it by their um, employer to see what the top employers are. So I want to um, facet it. And I want, also want it to be the job that where they're actually a data scientist and not like a previous employer. So I'm going to say facet it. Uh, this is pretty advanced. Um, where their um, employer name is what I want to facet on. Um, okay. And so let's give that a try. Okay, so you can see here, these within the 50 mile radius of here, here's how many data scientists work at each of these companies, right? So Facebook, Uber, LinkedIn, Apple, Airbnb, Metis, Walmart Labs, IBM, uh, Stitch Fix, into it. Okay. Um, that's how you do that. Um, Any questions so far about, about, about searching the knowledge graph? This is the number of data scientists. Yeah, so right. I mean, so, I, I mean, I want to use a product that is better than my control. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the product is very important. Right? Correctness is very important. Yeah. So, um, but it's one of the few ways you can search the whole web in a structured way, right? So Google search, um, it does have an API for Google search, but the results of that API is just web right? There are not many structured queries. I'm not waiting my turn file. I'm not waiting my turn file. So I'm going to do a now with your <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just run my better than just Google search things, but um, it's, um, there are, uh, aren't actually a lot of ways to compare it here, right, where you can actually do these structured queries relatively. Now, the question you have is that how do you know what the hell is accurate, like whether or not, um, like, if there's like 114 uh, data scientists at Google, um, you can, um, one feature that I mentioned before is you can actually inspect and audit the provenance of, of the data uh, to, to gain confidence about it. So if I wanted to, um, I can say, um, I want to get, uh, let's say, um, let's say, for example, I wanted to see, okay, um, who works at a data scientist at Stitch Fix, for example, right? So I could say people, um, And um, 
I'm using a feature of DQL, which is called a nested condition. So they're employed at Stitch Fix and their title is data scientist. And let's say um, we wanna show the, um, actually, um, I think this is a good opportunity that I could show you the, the dashboard and how that makes it a little bit easier to form queries. So that I was showing you earlier the um, Google Sheets, but you can also form the query here in the, in the dashboard, which you guys have access to. So I can say, um, I want um, people that are employed, the employer's name is Stitch Fix. So that's an alternative to writing a DQL query. Um, the DQL is more powerful though. Um, I can say, you know, uh, where, you, you can see that in the dashboard, there's an autocomplete that uses the ontology to help you fill in these fields. Um, so let's say data scientist. And um, so you can see here, um, data scientist. So um, you can um, look at the data. You can see here they have a this person has a LinkedIn Git, GitHub profile, Crunchbase profile. Um, you can uh, go and look at the original sources. So I could go to like Crunchbase, for example, and see here um, that it says here on this page, right? So this is where the information um, it read this. So it's data scientist at Stitch Fix. So um, this is like agreeing with what it says there in the knowledge graph. So there's like a degree of uh, transparency and uh, kind of a explainability where you can see uh, where the actual fields and properties came from in the knowledge graph. Um, okay, so hopefully it looks like most people have wrapped up the first tutorial. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the second one real quick. So let me describe the situation here. So this tutorial is all about analyzing uh, an internal data set, internal databases. So um, I basically uh, built a sample toy data set here. So take a look at this. Um, this is the kind of data that you might get from like a real internal database, right? Let's say of customers dumped from the, uh, you know, the, the delivery system, right? Or the shipping system. And this is, illustrating a lot of the data problems that you might see in real world data. So inside this example alone, you can see there's a lot of problems here. Um, let me zoom this in more that so you can see it. Um, there's incomplete data. So it's right away, there's no, no value here. Um, there's duplicated data. So like these two rows three and four are probably the same company, right? But they were just entered in at different points in time. Um, the way that the address is encoded is very inconsistent, right? Some, some is just like the name of the country. Some is like the city in the country. Some is um, like a suite. This one says second floor attention, Bob Goodman. Um, this one is, isn't even a location at all. It's an online location. It's the, it's the um, homepage. So maybe the person misunderstood when they entered that in. Um, you can also see it's, it's sort of inconsistent and like some of these are in all caps. Some of them are in regular casing. Uh, this one's not even in, in English. Um, this one is, has an interesting spelling of the word technologies, G-Y-S, and ink is spelled I-N-K. Um, so these are all the kinds of things you might see in a real data set, right? And this is obviously only 10 rows, but imagine in a real data set, it's probably more than 10 rows, right? Probably 10,000 rows, right? So uh, imagine, how much time you'd have to spend cleaning this up before you can start to do the basic levels of analysis with it, right? Um, so this is where machine learning can be employed to great effect. So if you just copy and paste these rows, let's say, and we put them into, you know, our fresh spreadsheet here. So let's create another sheet for that. And, um, See, it's, it's so messy that it doesn't even copy and paste correctly into the spreadsheet. 
Okay, so, all right, so this is what the data originally looked like, right? And let's say this is the, the customer, the company name, let's say, and this is what the address should be, right? But we need to clean this up a lot, right? To make this useful. So how can we make this look better um, and fix all of these, basically these 10 categories of different data problems all in one fell swoop using machine learning. Um, so we're gonna use what I mentioned, the, the, the answer of course is to use enhance. So I'm going to do um, enhance uh, an organization. So you see that's built in here. Um, and what I wanna get is a clean, uh, let's say an ID in our knowledge graph, the name, uh, the location, um, you, can, you can type in here any field that's available in the knowledge graph. So I also wanna know, uh, let's say the homepage of the company. I wanna know the, um, the uh, industries of that company. Um, I wanna know the, um, let's say the number of employees in that company. Um, this is all information that I wish I, I knew. Basically, it's, this data set's incomplete. It doesn't have that information, but I can automatically, like magic, fill it in. Um, what, am, what am I providing enhanced? So I, I am providing the name. Uh, I don't know the URL, so I'm just gonna leave that blank and I have the address. So you can see here, um, and let's see if I can copy and paste that. Um, so we've got basically the original noisy data on the left. On the right, you see it's automatically been filled in from the diff knowledge graph. Um, you see these two things that were duplicated, Collaboratex systems have the same identifier in the diff knowledge graph. And here's a clean address. Here's the homepage of that organization. Here's the industries it's in and here's how many employees it has. Um, now, right away I can see um, insight into our customer base in this hypothetical company that I didn't know before from looking at this. I, um, you can see from the industry tabs that, you know, looks like we're selling all the semiconductor companies, right? So I didn't, it's, it was not obvious to see that here from the original data. Um, it, the machine learning had no problem being able to link Palomar Technologies Inc. to Palomar Technologies based in Carlsbad. It, would, it had no problem linking this uh, either Jap Chinese or Japanese company name into the name of that company in English, Itochu and with its homepage and it's based in Osaka, Japan. And, and that's what they do, it's actually a pretty big company. Um, so uh, it handled perfectly fine, like these foreign companies with this missing data, I was able to fill in the data. So uh, we know that Xtronic is in uh, Switzerland, that's its homepage, you know, you could go there. Um, so imagine how much time it would have taken you to research all this yourself and fill this in, right? And uh, especially in a real database where you have 10,000 of these, right? I might have stalled the whole project. Um, let's say I wanted to make this a little bit more uh, visual. So I could say I want um, to get through DQL the... Um, I'm gonna to try to put the company logo here. So wish me luck. So I know that's the ID. So I'm gonna put that in. And the field that I want is the logo. Okay, so you can see those, that's the company logos. These are obviously the same company. It's pretty easy to see that visually. Um, and so now I can, um, now I can answer some simple questions now, right? In this newly enhanced and clean data, um, that'd be very difficult to answer in the original data, right? So for example, um, 
you know, what can we say about what these customers have in common? Well, it's very, it's obvious they're all semiconductor companies. Um, okay, so now the sales team wants to know how do we segment all these companies by company size and selling geography? Okay, we have that information here now, right? So I could, um, I could easily um, plot a distribution and uh, use that to assign these accounts to different teams. Um, the Asian accounts, the Middle Eastern accounts, uh, the ones in the US, I could, I could sign it by um, company size too. Um, okay, so I just wanna take a pause for a second here because I know that they've been going really fast. But you can see that just like, um, basically by running two queries, I've clean, totally cleaned up the database and fixed all 10 categories of those data problems, right? Uh, so it's very uh, powerful technology. Um, so here's um, uh, two bonus questions. And also I'll pose these questions and then I'll walk around the room and then I'll come back and I'll try to solve these questions. Um, we want to track uh, the latest changes about these companies. So how can we build automatically a news feed of all of the latest developments of this company directly inside this sheet? Um, and can we find more similar customers to these? And we know that these are semiconductor companies. How would we uh, fill in uh, and identify other prospective companies that are also semiconductor companies that seem to have like around 50 employees? That seems to be our sweet spot here. Okay. So uh, I'll walk around and help anyone that's having trouble. Here's, here's the, here's my syntax. Um, so if you have, what I was looking for is this autocomplete, but yeah, this is the, um, the fields is the first argument, then the name, URL, and location. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to do this bonus query. So this is a pretty tricky one, but I'm going to try to build a newsfeed of these companies, some of which seem quite obscure. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is these are the entity identifiers for these companies in the knowledge graph. So I want to I want to get all those into a query. So I'm going to say I'm going to join it. to make a DQL query, which is a concatenation of um, type um, articles, tags, um, actually, let's see if it's right. Um, I'm going to do this. So, first thing I want to do is to form entity identifiers for each of um, default URIs for each of these. So, concatenate. Yeah. And then I'm going to 
join this. form a DQL query that's asking for articles where the topic of that article is an or, so I'm using the Boolean expression, and it can be any of these entities and as given by those, those entity identifiers in this list. So it's articles about any of these companies here. And I'm gonna run this and I'm going to produce the article title and the author of the article and the date. Um, actually, I also want to sort them. Okay. So I'm going to add a sort by date. I'm going to do my DQL and I want the title, I want the Say the um, author of the article, the date, the, um, the page the article is from, and let's see that sounds good for now. Okay, that wasn't good. I'm going to test out my query inside the dashboard. There we go. Okay. So, why is there, oh, I guess there was a Japanese company in there. So these these articles are all about our hypothetical customers inside this example. So, um, if we were to look at one of these articles. This is about Itochu, which is one of the customers in there. And we were able to access this information even though uh, it's not in English. So it's a multilingual technology. Um, now they seem to be, that's what a lot of the news seems to be about it. All right, there you go. Um, let's say I wanted to take that one out because it's, I don't, can't read it. So one thing that's special about this spreadsheet is this spreadsheet is synchronized to the knowledge graph with these functions. So the data in the spreadsheet will never be out of date, which uh, I don't think you could say that about, about many spreadsheets. Um, it's always, every time you visit it, it's gonna be querying and populating it with whatever is the fresh data. So if, if for example, this company moved and that's no longer their headquarters anymore, um, instead of having a, an Excel file that has the old information, you're, you have one that always has the up-to-date information. So there you go. So these um, these articles are all of the articles about this set of companies sorted by date. So I just have like a news feed here now. I can read these.
Okay, can we generate a list of similar companies that have these attributes? So uh, this is the last one. So we wanna generate a list of companies that are like our customers. So that's a straightforward DQL. I want um, type organizations where the industry, um, let's say, let's use the categories name is, sorry, just, it's um, semiconductor and um, where the company size, so let's say the number of employees is at most 50. These are really small companies. Um, and let's say I want to know the company's name, uh, location, kind of these attributes I already have at the homepage. The, um, let's see what else, the description maybe. Um, so there we go. Got a list of prospects now for the sales team. Um, if I want a visual on this, I could get their default IDs. So I could look at each one of these in the knowledge graph um, entity, put in that ID. And so um, I can now um, do some very simple data exploration. So I can browse this company. I can see articles about it. I can see uh, who the founder is. Uh, it's a knowledge graph, so that means all of these are linked to each other. I can, you know, so he's also on the board, which is an executive management role. So it's all normalized of micro bridge technologies, right? I could look at that. So yeah, that was, uh, so that's the end of the tutorial. Um, so uh, we're a little bit over time, but um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, hopefully you got some theoretical knowledge about this technology and how powerful it is. And you also got some practical hands-on experience actually working with it, right? And, um, and you have a good platform you know, like to play around with as a starting point. Um, you can use it for any personal use, right? It would, it would uh, uh, normally be a startup tier level, the tokens you guys all got. So that would normally cost uh, $2.99 a month, like over $3,000 a month uh, a year. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to thank our Peter uh, organizers for having mine. Uh, and I want to open up for doing questions about either um, the tutorials or about the technology itself. So we crawl the web, right? So you can't download the whole web, obviously, right, to your, your local computer. But you can export um, the results of these queries, right, as JSON or uh, as CSV, um, and or via API calls, and to, to do for local analysis. So um, our crawl the web is very similar to Google's crawl the web for the ongoing interest. But we also have we actually have another product called Crawl Demo, which allows you to uh, create your own custom crawl and have control of whatever you, you want it to be.
Uh, any other questions? Yeah, you can use it within your application, obviously, right? Uh, uh, in terms of our customers, it's quite broad, right? There's binary something online that's terribly complex, like a really fundamental primitive like on-page type of storage. Um, and so it's quite broad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh,
So, so taxonomy itself is actually a really interesting application or alpha or knowledge graph as well. So um, we have a hybrid approach. So the top, we have top level types, right? So um, you saw the saw the documentation page, there's like type person, organization, uh, article, item. So these are the categories of entities that we think um, are at a broad level. Uh, we, we did some studies on the web and we found that you know, like 98% of the information on the web can be derived from one of these top level types, right? The lower level types in our ontology, um, the people that can't, you know, um, can't cover all of the remodeled quality purposes. So that's where it's actually the academic research and machine learning to automatically learn what are the lower levels of the tree of knowledge, right? And so for those lower levels, like, you know, for example, a company's um, industry, right, you might have very high level industries like manufacturing, software, stuff. Super, super low level where it's like IoT or you know, particular kinds of you know chips or something like that, where we're not going to be able to cover that area of knowledge, but machine learning could automatically learn that, right? That's an active area of research. So how can you um, observe from all of the data that we gather? What are the ways that other human beings can drive the world? It's an active research topic, actually, which um, a lot of companies are interested in this lot because of our ability to structure that automatically. Um, and so the way we think about the internet is the internet is really like the world's largest man-made sensor. Um, people put things content on the internet about entities that they care about. So the internet is a natural way to bias it towards uh, the things that human beings find useful, which is uh, the category of the knowledge that they care about. Uh, another really um, interesting research topic, which I won't be able to do, do justice to, is how do you make uh, categories of knowledge and ontologies that are across different languages, right? So if you're crawling the internet, uh, only a portion of the internet is English, right? But um, the, um, there's also a few portions of Chinese, and Spanish, and Italian, and German, and we have multilingual NLP, so we can, re we can classify visually the pages, the person getting into this whole information, even if the page is written in non-English, and then we have NLP that can read the, the information that's in the other language. But we need to be able to unify that into a single knowledge graph that you can query this problem. This is a step beyond even what Google does, right? If you use Google search and you're like a Malaysian game speaker, for example, you're not actually searching the whole web, you're only searching the Malaysian web, which is a very small slice of the web. But you saw uh, in sort of the tutorial example, I, I can even uh, start out uh, with some entities and access Japanese knowledge Japanese articles. I don't need to know, I don't need to know Japanese in order to ask those questions. And that's because of our ability to unify languages to fit your um, So it's really interesting to think about, like medical knowledge, for example, right? There's Western medicine, there's Eastern medicine. What is the intersection of the entities that are that intersection that sets? And how can we build a unified knowledge graph in an objective way? So, as we know, there are um, the obtained for articles. So, how do you use SEO knowledge graph? How does it do it? Does it do it depends on the info article versus the other customers? How do you track it? How do you use the track it? And along the story question about time, how do you use the facts that they Okay, 
Um, so the public has access to public information, right? So we don't um, we don't know that whether or not you're getting paid to write your website. Right? So, like, so we're, we're very interested in accurate information, right? What the problem is trying to solve for people is to clean their data, right? And to structure information. You know. None of it is useful if it's not accurate, right? So, um, one of the areas of our pipeline is called knowledge fusion, right? Which Julia touched on. That's how um, you can take information from multiple pages and use all that to produce an entity in knowledge graph, right? Each of these, each piece of information in the knowledge graph is derived from not a single page, but multiple sources, right? So we need to have algorithms that can automatically um, rank the uh, confidence you have that this is a true fact, right? And not uh, a fact that um, uh, the rest of the knowledge doesn't agree with, right? It's a pretty technical area of research, right? But imagine, for example, um, you know, I, there's a big page about me somewhere on the web that says I live, you know, on the planet Venus, right? How does that not get part of the knowledge graph, right? Our algorithms would say that is very unlikely to a very low confidence on because it doesn't agree with any of the other pages on the web, right? And also, uh, you could use things like ontological reasoning, right? So that the planet of Venus is millions of miles away from the planet Earth. You know, that work at Hitchcock, which is in California, in the United States, on Senator, right? So um, you can score that in a fact or very unlikely to be true, right? So uh, we, uh, there's a degree of confidence about each of the statements out there in the web that uh, we are trying to objectives or kind of automate the process of human research. And so, for example, just give a hypothetical example, or right? let's say some. You know, uh, someone trying to like influence the next election and then puts like a big progress blog up and has all these uh, fake news articles, right? Um, we would assign a very low trust to that, that new origin that we crawl over because um, that information, first of all, we can use the time and aspects, right, to know that that was just a newly formed domain, right? There's no history of that. And it also doesn't agree with facts from the rest of the So uh, we call that technology based trust. Yes. You can, yeah. We make it available to our customers, right? So you can audit the feed. So you can download the, there's different modes. There's the regular JSON mode, and then there's called JSON Extended. What JSON Extended gives you is the original primary sources of each fact that has metadata, so that you can check it. And it also gives you the confidence score. I was joining the, the company myself and I was using the search, but I didn't find my Facebook page. So I don't face this uh, other one. So why did you find it? Okay, so you, you try to look at all of them and all that. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. Search not in vain. Okay, uh, it's not about a crawl that page. Yeah, right. Or it might be that there could be many reasons uh, something is not in all graphic case, not public information. Right? So it's like that behind a login or and if it is then it could be that um we haven't called that page yet in our, in our call to web right um we actually have um, a mode as a more advanced option that allows you to force a refresh uh, using a particular origin so you can actually um you can get into the all draft and with this special mode you can fetch all the original pages that that you would come from and you can re fetch uh, them. You also use a hardware to do that. Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah. Um, well, I think the interesting thing about yeah, running an AI company was uh, sort of like a fundamental rhythm of the technology. Customers surprised us with the interesting ways they could use it. 
Um, I think one interesting one that I've in mind is someone used a bot to build a search engine for Google. So Google and using a web browser general is not very accessible if you're a blind person, right? The screen reader is inherent reading all the text left and right, you know, on the screen, including the nav bar and all the ads that were read it, things like that. Uh, but with accessibility, using the machine our machine side to parse you know, classified data. We clean it up a lot, but we know this is an article one year better. So um, they were able to um, basically uh, a lot of persons were able to uh, ask the question and then get a very clean response. Okay. So um just uh, thank you for coming so many questions. Thank you all for coming.